Hello, welcome to Breaking All Down. I'm Count Zero. We're coming up to the penultimate part of the Season Flight series, this episode, with Book 3, Earthman Come Home. The book, as with Book 2, follows New York City with Joe Amalfi still as the uh, city city's mayor, though Chris, the city manager, who became the first city manager of New York in Book 2, is no longer in the role. Um, the dialogue doesn't state his fate, but it does state that two of the previous city managers um, basically had ignoble fates. One was removed by the city fathers, and the other one was killed in the line of duty. I'd say that they dropped a bridge on Chris, were not for the fact that technically Book 2 was published after this one. So, I guess a bit of confusion there in terms of, um, at least on my part, in terms of what was going through James Blish's mind when he wrote this book, um, rather, when he book, wrote Book 2, about whether or not he considered this book too much when putting the character of Chris in the book and making him city manager. Earthman Come Home tonally um, st sticks in the same sort of semi-episodic format of the uh, that the last book had, but with the books tying, with, rather with the episodes within the book tying together into more of a coherent whole. It I describe it almost as like a like a season of a television series, as opposed to the last one where it could have just been a series of separate short stories on their own. The story starts out with New York City coming into the conflict between three forces and attempting to make a quick buck from, ideally, all three sides. The first part of the conflict is the war between the democratic semi-utopian Hamiltonians, which are probably a little bit more hippy-dippy than Alexander Hamilton himself was, and their neighbors, which are basically being run by a um, evil totalitarian government, which has all the totalitarianism of the Nazis, even if they don't have the whole racial purity thing going on. And the third faction in all of this is the space cops, who, near as I can tell, are showing up basically to overthrow the governments of both sides and force them to bow to the whims of the Earth. New York City basically makes a quick buck out of the arrangement and picks up a, co a new potential citizen, a Hamiltonian woman named D. New, uh, Amalfi takes New York on a merry chase from the cops and lead them, leads them into an area of space which, basically, has no stars save one, where they pick up a signal from another city that's being attacked by a pirate city called a Bindlestiff. Um, New York comes to pick up the survivors of the only on the only planet in the system and manage, manages to destroy the other city in the process of, well, turning the planet into an Oki city through setting up spin dizzies on it in spite of the objections of the city fathers. This actually makes somewhat logical sense, not so much the City Father's recommendation, though that does too, but the turning a planet into an Oki City, uh, based on the fact that the spin dizzies are anti-gravity generators, and the, and thus the more mass you have, the faster you go. This is why a, well, city is a more viable interstellar craft than, well, your normal cigar-shaped space, uh, spaceship or Star Trek-style starship. That extra mass actually is an asset, because the more mass you have, the faster you go. It's, it's like the inverse of gravity. Um, so, it actually, it's a fairly logical idea in the uh, setting. The third act of the story involves New York returning to the galaxy after bailing off the planet um, that they, well, sent flying in the middle act before leaving the Galactic Rim. And so now they're heading back into the main part of the galaxy and getting repairs and basically fixing up all the damage from what happened with the fight with the Bindlestiff. Anyway, New York returns to the populated portions of the galaxy in need of repairs, only to discover that they, well, can't afford them, as the galactic economy has collapsed. A massive group of Okies is planning to march on Earth to demand satisfaction for all of this. Amalfi is a little concerned by this, as he's worried that, man, that other forces, like the last known survivor of the Earth-Vega War, the Vegan Orbital Fort, could show up as part of this. Amalfi is unable to stop the march, though, so New York City listens to the direct transmitter broadcasts while the 
while they work on mounting spin dizzies on an uninhabited planet. The government of Earth demands the Okimart stop, and when they don't, the space cops are ordered to fire. To the credit of the space cops, they're not jackbooted thugs. They are reluctant to fire on effectively unarmed targets. I read a lot of books where the space cops would be painted as two-dimensional jackbooted thugs with itchy trigger fingers and a insane desire to execute their authority in a semi-literal sense. Um, and Blish remembers that why... And with this, that while humanity has gone out to the stars, they're still human beings. They act like human beings. And yes, there have been utter psychopaths in human history. But the majority of people aren't. And thus, very likely, the majority of people who might become space cops aren't. And it's a nice touch. It's something that other writers forget when they're writing science fiction when they're writing something like Space Cops in science fiction. Through all of this, Amalfi has discovered that his worst fears have come to pass. The vegan orbital fort is amongst the ranks of the Oki March. Thus, he puts his plan into action. He activates the spin disease and rams the planet headlong into the vegan orbital fort, destroying it entirely. It says something. You have a moment as incredibly awesome as someone piloting a planet into a spaceship in a work of fiction that no one has attempted to capture the glory and majesty of this moment in a visual medium of any kind. The final act of the story has New York, unable to um, achieve repairs in the terrible galactic economy, wanted by the space cops, and with the momentum of the march on Earth being disrupted by everyone basically going, holy crap, someone just destroyed the vegan orbital fort of the planet, being forced to find a mostly uninhabited planet to settle down on. Unfortunately, they aren't the first Oki planet, Oki uh, city to have this idea. It turns out that the city has been settled here by none other than the most infamous spindle stiff of all time, Interstellar Master Traders, which was set up in some passing dialogue in the second book, which technically came after this, which probably means this more a situation of... Um, well, Blish trying to fill in a expository oversight. Anyway. From here, it will take all of Joe Amalfi's wits and the resources of New York City, what resources remain, to defeat this pirate city and carve themselves a future. Earthman Come Home is, frankly, the best installment of the Cities in Flight series thus far. Now, this is definitely helped by the fact that this is the first installment. And while the other stories are nice in how they handle the exposition and um, set up the universe. Once that's done, and you can just come in here, you get the universe, you get the setting, you get the whole idea of Okies and all that, you're going to sit down and em enjoy and en engulf yourself in this universe um, without having any baggage, without having to sit, to sit around and deal with too much exposition. It, all the exposition's done, now we can get into the real adventure. And that makes this story work incredibly well. The fact that this story was kind of meant to stand alone from the beginning also kind of helps, too. So I'll get to the last installment of Cities in Flight at a later date. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed this episode, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for notification when the next episode comes up. And next time... We'll see what we do. I'll see you then.